Okay, so today we're going to start chapter two. In this chapter, in this chapter, there's going to be a lot of vocabulary and we're going to be writing a lot of sentences or statements. So the name of this chapter is Analyzing Conditional Statements. So the first definition is a conditional statement. It's going to have two parts. It's going to have a hypothesis and a conclusion. The hypothesis is generally, if you look at like mathematical notation, it'll be indicated by the letter P and the conclusion will be indicated with the letter Q. So what you might see, and we're gonna see this in a chart coming up, they'll have a capital P, or not a capital, a lowercase P with an arrow, and then they'll have the letter Q. That would be the mathematical symbols that you might see on a standardized test. It's going to be written in if-then form. Now, this conditional statement may or may not be true. So in this sentence here, if you study, so you study is the hypothesis. So it's the P. And then the conclusion here will be you will get an A. And that's indicated by usually the letter Q. And this will be your conclusion. Now, so here, this statement may or may not be true. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's false. So in this particular case, if you study, then you will get an A. Well, depends on how much you studied. If you only studied a little bit, you might not get that A. If you studied a lot, potentially you would get the A. So this is where this sentence could be true if you studied a lot, or it could be false if you only studied a little. So again, the conditional statement may be true or it may be false. The next thing I ask you to identify the hypothesis, don't include the word if. It's all the words after the word if, and then if they ask you to identify the conclusion, it's all the words after the word then. One is the negation of a statement, and that's just coming up with the opposite of the original statement. Then the negation of a statement is the opposite of the original statement. Now, sometimes you're gonna have to add in the word not to make it opposite, or sometimes you might take out the word not. So for example, it is raining, the opposite of it is raining is it is not raining. And then the second example, if it's got the word not in there, the shirt is not red, then you could take out the word not when you wanna write the opposite, and you could say the shirt is red. Now, in some cases, we may not be able to just put in the word not. We may have to change the grammar to make it sound grammatically correct. Um, but you're just trying to make it the opposite of what the statement says. Again, for here, what we did was we added in the word not to make it opposite. And here, we took out the word not to make it the opposite. And this one is called converse. And a converse is formed by changing the order of the hypothesis and the conclusion. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch it. The hypothesis goes to the conclusion and the conclusion goes to the hypothesis. So in this particular example, the original statement, the hypothesis was you study the conclusion was you will get an A. So when you want to write the converse, this conclusion has now gone and it now becomes the new hypothesis. And then the old hypothesis now becomes the new conclusion. So this now becomes the new Q. So we're switching the order. Now notice on this, I changed the tense of the verb. So here, it originally had, you will get an A, and then I changed it to got. So you can change it so it makes sense. Um, and then here I also changed the word study to studied. 
So you can change it so it sounds grammatically correct. Because you don't want to say, if you, get an, if you get an A, then you study. Studied sounds better than study in the second sentence. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can make it sound grammatically correct. So the inverse is formed by negating both the hypothesis and the conclusion. So the original statement, if you studied, then you will get an A. Now, my inverse, I need to negate both. So to make it sound grammatically correct, I'm not going to say, if you not study, then you not then you will not get an A, that you could put it in there. But what I did instead of saying not in this case, I used um, the word didn't. So again, if you put in there, if you not study, then you will not get an A, that would technically be correct, but try to make it sound grammatically correct. So what we added in here to the hypothesis is the word didn't to ne negate it, and then the same thing to the conclusion. So we're making them both opposite or negate them. Is the word contrapositive. It's the biggest word and it has the most work. It's got two steps. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna change it to the converse and then we're gonna negate both the hypothesis and conclusion. So what we're gonna do is flip it first and then negate second. So in my original statement, if you study, then you will get an A. So the first thing I did from here to here, changing it from original to converse, I flipped the order. And I changed the hypothesis and made it now the conclusion. And then the conclusion is now the hypothesis. And again, I changed the tense of the verbs. And then from this step to this step, I did the negation. So I added in to the hypothesis, the word didn't, and to the conclusion, didn't. So you flip and negate. So again, maybe one way to remember it, it's the longest word out of all those vocab words, but it's got the most work. Biconditional statements. So for this one, if the conditional statement and its converse are both true, then the statement can be written as a biconditional statement. And what we're gonna add in are the words, if and only if. Now, my abbreviation for if and only if, if instead of writing these four words, if you wanna put in the letters IFF, then you don't have to write it all out. But for you guys, you're doing the big ideas homework. So you're just gonna be probably picking a multiple choice or a drag and drop. Um, but on the test or the quiz, if you had to handwrite these sentences, instead of writing those four words, you could put IFF. Now, any definition could be written as a biconditional statement. In my example here, if an angle has a measure of 90 degrees, then it's a right angle. This is actually a true statement because it is the definition of a right angle. So you need to make sure that the original conditional, which is this, if it's true, then we have to state the converse. And remember for the converse, we need to flip the order. And if it's true, then we can write a biconditional statement. So let me go ahead and turn this statement into its converse by reversing the order. So I'm gonna say if an angle is a right angle, then it has a measure of 90 degrees. And this is also a true statement. So the converse is true. So because the original conditional is true and it's converse, I now can write a biconditional. When you write the biconditional, 
what you're gonna do is drop the word if, drop the word then, and in place of the word then, you're gonna add in the words if and only if. So you have options here. You can either write the biconditional based off the converse or based off the original. So let me go ahead and just do it for the converse first. So my biconditional based off of the converse. because it's right above, just to show you. So what I would do is I'm gonna drop the word if, I'm gonna drop the word then, and in place of the word then, I'm adding in the, the words if and only if. So my biconditional is going to be an angle is a right angle If and only if, and I'm gonna spell out the words this time, but for the, the other one, I'm gonna do the abbreviation. It has a measure. Of 90 degrees. This is the biconditional based off of the converse. I could also write a biconditional based off of my original. So again, remember, you're gonna drop the word if, I'm gonna drop the word then, and in the place of the word then, I'm adding in if and only if. So let me go ahead and write now a biconditional. And it's gonna be based off the original conditional. Now, on the test, if it doesn't specify you have options, you could do either one. Now, they may specify and say, write the biconditional based off the original statement or the original conditional. And if that's the case, you would write an angle has a measure of 90 degrees if and only if, so if you don't wanna write out all the words like I did here, you can put in the abbreviation and then you would put is a right angle. And that's how you write a biconditional. You can only do this when both the conditional and the converse are true statements. Anytime it's a definition, you will be able to write a biconditional. So the next slide, these are just notations of um, what you may see on a standardized test. So whenever they say the conditional statement with symbols, again, remember the hypothesis is the P, the conclusion is the Q. So they may write it as a P and then an arrow pointing to the Q. For the converse, remember it's flipped. So Q, then P. And then to write an inverse or to negate it, it looks like the little symbol that's on top of the equal sign for the congruence. It's like a little wave in front of the letters. So this would say, you're saying if not P, then not Q. That would be the inverse, how you might see symbols. And then the contrapositive, remember this is the longest word. So you flip it and negate it. So you would write not Q and not P, then not P. And then the biconditional, this if and only if, remember you could write it either way, either based off of the conditional or the converse. So that's why the arrow points in both directions. Now we're just gonna do some examples using all of these vocabulary words we just learned. So here it says, use red to identify the hypothesis and blue to identify the conclusion, then rewrite the, condi the, rewrite the conditional statement in if-then form. Now, if we have to add in more words to make it sound grammatically correct, we can. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna write down the word if. And here the statement was, all birds have feathers. So that it makes sense grammatically, 
I'm gonna go in and add in if an animal is a bird, then it has feathers. And notice I did the conclusion in blue and my hypothesis is in red. When they ask you to identify a hypothesis, it's everything after the word if. The conclusion will be after the word then. Then the next one, you are in Texas if you are in Houston. So notice we've got, it's backwards though, but here is my hypothesis, and then here would be my conclusion, but I gotta add in the word if, and then. So if is here already. So if you are in Houston, then you are in Texas. So tie this sentence to like Florida. Like if I said, if you're in Southwest ranches, then you're in Florida. That's true. But if I said, if you're in Florida, then you're in Southwest ranches, that's, that's a false statement because you could be in Miami or in Orlando. So depending on what's said, even though it sort of makes sense, if it's not totally true, one could be true, one could be false. For the next one, it says let P, and remember P is the hypothesis. So this is gonna be my hypothesis. And then my conclusion is gonna be you are a musician. So this is the conclusion. And then it says write each statement in words, then decide whether it's true or false. So I'm gonna turn it first for part A into an if-then statement. Then for part B, I'm gonna write the converse, so I'll reverse the order. Then for part C, I'm gonna write the inverse, which I'm gonna be negating both of them. And then the contrapositive, I'm going to flip and negate. So this is where you need to know all of these vocab words to understand how to write these sentences. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna write my first part A was the conditional. And remember that was if P then Q. And this is read as if P then Q. And again, P, let me do it in color here. P is the red and then Q was the conclusion. So I'm gonna write if and then underlined in red on the previous slide was, you are a guitar player. Then you are a musician. And then now we have to decide, is this true or false? And this statement is true because guitar players, and if they ask you to explain, you would say guitar players are musicians. Now for the converse. Remember the converse? We're gonna switch the order. So it's if Q, then P. So it's read as if Q, then P. So now we're gonna fill it in. 
So remember, originally I had written the converse in blue, so I'll just go ahead and do the same thing, but even though this is gonna be now the new hypothesis, so if you are a musician, then you are a guitar player. And now we have to decide, is this true or false? And this would be a false statement because not all musicians play the guitar. You could play the drums, you could play the piano. So not all musicians play the guitar. Um, examples. You could play the drums, you could play piano, any other musical instrument. So now for the inverse, which was part C, this was part B. Remember for the inverse, what we're doing is not P, then not Q. And this is red if the little wave is not P, then not Q. So let's go ahead and fill it in. So if you are not a guitar player, then you are not a, music, a musician. And now we have to decide, is this true or false? And this is false, good. So even if you don't play the guitar, you can still be a musician because you could be playing a, a different musical instrument. So your reason, even if you do not play the guitar, you can still be a musician. And then the last one, the longest, is the word contrapositive. And that is gonna be not Q. If not Q, then not P. So remember, we flip and negate. So again, in words, it would be if not Q, then not black, then not P. Okay, so let's go ahead and rewrite it. So it's if you are not a musician, then you are not a guitar player. And then this one would be a true statement because a person who is not a musician cannot be a guitar player.
one. It says, rewrite the definition of perpendicular lines as a single biconditional. Remember, this is where we're going to add in the words if and only if. So for here, it says, if two lines intersect to form a right angle, then they are perpendicular lines. So again, we could identify this is my hypothesis. This is my conclusion. Now remember, in order to write a biconditional, the original conditional needs to be true, which is this one. So this is P, if P, then Q. That's the conditional. Remember, for the converse, we flip it. So we're going to do Q, if Q, then P. So the converse would have been if two lines are perpendicular, perpendicular lines, then they intersect. to form a right angle. Now I'm going to write the biconditional and I'm gonna use my original. So remember it can go either way. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my original statement and I'm gonna drop the word if. So I'm gonna do two lines, intersect, to form a right angle. I'm dropping the word then. I'm putting in if and only if. And again, if you'd rather write IFF here, you can. And then now the conclusion. They are perpendicular lines. and that's a biconditional. One last example, and they want us to write the next example as a biconditional. So for the last one, it says to rewrite the pair of conditionals as a biconditional, and these are both already written for us, so they're kinda crammed in here. So this one right here is the original conditional. So the green is the conditional. And then if I underline this one, this is the converse. So I already wrote the converse and the conditional. So now I can write my biconditional and I'm gonna base it off of the original, the green. So my new biconditional is gonna be M is between, remember you drop the word if, L and N, if and only if, LM plus MN equals LN. So this is based off the green, the conditional. If you wanted to base it off the converse, again, you would drop the words if and then and add in IFF here. So you would put LM plus MN equals ln if and only if m is between 